of my life have been profoundly influenced by trash, and specifically plastic trash that saturates our society, that winds up on our streets and rivers, and washes out to sea. And to illustrate what an impact this trash has had on my life, um, this opening shot here is from my honeymoon, crossing the, <laughs> crossing the North Atlantic gyre that our last speaker referred to in the dead of winter with 12 other people on board, a real intimate affair. <laughs> but fortunately, my husband shares my sense of romance. <laughs> we had gotten engaged two years ago, in the middle of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which some of you may have heard of, an infamous area of the Pacific, Pacific Ocean that's filling up with plastic debris. In the following year, we got married on a cycling speaking tour from Vancouver to Mexico, wearing styly plastic outfits that an artist made out of uh, trash bags. So now that I've outed myself as a trash fanatic, I'm gonna share with you a bit of what I've learned about plastic waste um, and why it so fascinates me. So how did we get to this point today when plastic, a relatively new material, can be found on virtually every shoreline and every ocean in the world. What impact is this having on our marine ecosystems? And importantly to us, what impact is this having on the food chain that sustains us? And finally, what can we do about it? Well, first, I want to back up to the 1950s, and this is when plastics first started entering our average American household. And this is how plastics were, were sold to us. It was a miracle material. It was lightweight, cheap. Uh, it would last forever. And it was even spun to us as a boon to women's liberation. Because for the housewife, you were saved from ever having to do the dishes again. Why bother when you could just throw it all away? Well, very quickly, this plastic production boomed. It was uh, seen to be a great contributor to progress and to convenience. And in many ways, that seemed like a good deal. It was cheap because no one was yet thinking about true environmental costs. It was lightweight, so you didn't need as many fossil fuels to ship and transport it. But now we're finding many years later that there was one flaw in this whole problem. We weren't really thinking about the long-term plan. And you can say this with, with many environmental issues. What would become of all this disposable packaging, the cups and the straws and the bags that saturate our life? You can see it's been a fairly steady increase. Fun little dip here when we had an oil embargo in the 70s, because as many of you know, <coughs> plastic is a petroleum product. But those same properties of plastic, that it's cheap, it's lightweight, and it's designed to last forever, are now coming back to haunt us. So in a throwaway society, just where is a way? Well, I come from Los Angeles, so you're probably not gonna see an image quite like this here in Vermont, but you'll see this in many of our major me metropolitan areas after rain. It's the disposable cups and bags and straws and forks that we see lining our streets that wash out to sea. So in a throwaway society, where is a way? Here is a way. This is Camilla Beach on the big island of Hawaii. Uh, this is not a, an area many people go to. It's far from hotels and development. And as I was walking around this beach, picking up detergent bottles and shampoo bottles and looking at the writing, it was in Japanese, Chinese, Korean, Spanish, and English. So this is not debris that's coming from your beach goers in Hawaii. This is literally washing up from all around the world. Where is a way? Here is a way. This is Mae West, a common snapping turtle that as a baby got caught in a plastic milk jug ring. And again, that plastic is so durable, it's literally designed to last forever, that she couldn't break its shell. She's now about the size of a football. They cut the ring, but she will never quite be the same. So in a throwaway society, this is a way. Now, very few people have a chance to go see this plastic pollution floating thousands of miles from land, um, apart from the Navy or fishermen or um, sailors. That is until two stories brought this to the world's attention. One involving plastic bath toys and one an oceanographer from Long Beach, California. But before I explain these two stories, we need a little bit of Ocean Currents 101. So every ocean has what's called a gyre. It's a complex network of currents that create sort of like a massive whirlpool, or as the case is today, it's more like a massive toilet bowl that never flushes. This is the North Pacific gyre, um, where I'm closest to also known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Now this gyre spans an area roughly twice the size of the continental United States. And these powerful currents can complete a single rotation in six to 10 years. Now there are 11 gyres in the world, but this has become sort of the media darling. And now these two stories are gonna explain why. The first one is the, the curiously cute story of the plastic bath toys. So back in 1992, there was a shipping accident in the middle of the Pacific which dumped uh, several shipping containers full of 70,000 some plastic bath toys. <laughs> now these started washing up, um, these plastic duckies in particular started washing up in Sitka, Alaska, which attracted the attention of the local media and also uh, Seattle-based oceanographer Curtis Ebesmeyer. 
which led to a decades-long investigation that still continues today, um, figuring out where these currents bring floating objects around the world. Now, I just happened to be in Sitka, Alaska last week, and after giving a presentation at the local Sitka Sound Science Center, they gave me my very own rubber duck, plastic ducky. And uh, I think they're amused by how excited it made me, but this little guy traveled some thousand mile, thousands of miles before reaching my hand. So I'll let you take a look at that. You can pass it around. I like show and tell. <laughs> the second incident is where my whole zigzag begins with this story. Um, so this is Captain Charles Moore from Long Beach, California. And he was sailing from Hawaii to Los Angeles in 1997 and came across a curious collection of floating plastic debris. He had sailed as a child and didn't remember anything like this. Day after day after day, it was bottle caps and lighters and toothbrushes. And this led to a year later, he's coming back with research equipment and starting to collect samples on the surface of the ocean. Now, I first heard Captain Moore speak in 2002. I had just gotten my degree in environmental policy at the Monterey Institute, which I hear is now a partner. So I thought I knew a fair amount about the oceans and the environment, but I knew nothing about this issue. It was news to me. So um, after this talk, I was haunted for four <coughs> weeks. And I did finally what I encourage many students to do when you hear something that, that interests you. I picked up the phone and I called Captain Moore. And after about the 20th phone call, he invited me on his next research cruise, um, not cruise exactly, expedition, <laughs> as a volunteer. <laughs> and this one was not to the gyre. This was to a small island off the coast of Baja, California, called Guadalupe, where there's a large population of these beautiful birds called Laysan albatross. Now, we were looking for possible stomach, oops, plastic ingestion by these birds. Oh, tech failure here. <coughs> and my charge was to capture footage of the, of the babies feeding, which you're going to see. Oh, what happened? Oh. Did that count for my minutes? <laughs> Trust here will, will fly for thousands of miles collecting food, which they bring back to their chicks. Um, I was able to watch one parent and child duo as they started their little feeding ritual. It's a, a beautifully awkward dance where the baby waddles up to the parent, prods it with its beak, and that's a signal to the parent to regurgitate. Now, there's something profoundly sweet about watching that moment of a parent feeding a child, but that experience was marred by what I now know about the feeding grounds for these birds. Every single stomach sample we collected had anywhere from 30 to 50 and upwards of 60% plastic. And when you come across dead birds on places like Guadalupe Island or Midway Island in the Pacific, you now see something like this. This is the remains of a Laysan albatross on Midway Island, and you can see its body cavity is literally spilling out with plastic trash. So I came back to land profoundly moved for this. For the first time, I really made the connection between land and sea, that our culture of convenience on land is having impacts far from our line of sight. So um, a couple years later, I got an invitation that seemed to me the invitation of a lifetime, and that was to cross the North Pacific Gyre with Captain Moore. Now, I've received this invitation from um, Al Galita's research director, Dr. Marcus Erickson. The chance to see the gyre was, for me, a dream, but I also couldn't help but notice that Dr. Erickson was pretty interesting himself. So here we are, a crew of six, five sailors and myself. I was a novice, but very eager to learn. And we sailed 4,000 miles from Hawaii um, east and back to, back to California. What we did on this trip is we collected samples. We use a manta trawl, it's like a plankton net, which we skim on the surface of the ocean, collecting both zooplankton and plastic. Now, seeing is believing, and in the vein of show and tell, I'm gonna pass around one of our samples from the North Pacific Gyre in 2008. You'll see this confetti of broken down plastic mixed in with the life out there. And we also collected samples at night, and our nighttime samples look very different. You can see here this slurry of fish. These are deeper sea foraging fish called nyctophids, or lanternfish. We brought 671 of these fish back to land, and here's what we found inside their stomachs. Now these aren't exactly cute and cuddly fish, but they're extremely important for the ecosystem. They make up roughly 60% of the ocean's fish biomass, and they also feed the larger fish that you and I eat the mahi-mahi, the tuna, the squid. So here's what we found in one single stomach. You can see how much the plastic looks like <coughs> the zooplankton they're meant to be eating. And here's the stomach sample of another. Total, roughly 35% of these nyctophid fish have plastics in their stomachs. So there's no longer any doubt that this stuff is getting into the food chain that we depend on. Now the other profoundly life-changing event that happened on this trip 
was when Dr. Erickson fished out a piece of derelict fishing gear, knit a little blue ring, and proposed. And I thought that that was extremely fitting to women in the audience. <laughs> I thought that was extremely fitting, a proposal in the middle of the garbage patch, and I said yes. And at that moment, my personal and professional collided in many ways. In a good way, of course. But we came back to land with, um, with this new knowledge that we know plastic's impacting animals, but now it's getting into the food chain that potentially is impacting you and I. So what can we do to get people's attention? Well, Marcus being a pretty creative, out-of-the-box thinker said, let's build a boat out of 15,000 plastic bottles, we'll sail it from Long Beach to, uh, to Hawaii, and get the world's attention. We decided to call it Junk, and I was the land support, not yet quite a sailor enough for an expedition like this, but there were three of us. Uh, we set to, to building the boat. I had no idea how dangerous this really was. So like a good ride to be, I started collecting 15,000 plastic bottles <laughs> with my husband and our friend Joel Paschal, who's a super sailor. We scoured every junkyard in Los Angeles to find old shipping masks, made a frame, figured for a cabin uh, that this would do from another junkyard in uh, Los Angeles, tied the whole thing together, and here she is on departure day, June 1st, 2008, the voyage of junk wrap. Now, the actual voyage would take a long time to tell. There were many incredible, um, incredible things that happened on this trip. They almost ran out of food. They met a, a woman who was rowing a rowboat from San Francisco to Australia. Um, yeah. I had to stage a rescue operation on day four because we never thought to actually glue the caps on the bottles and the boat started sinking. Um, but they made it. They made it and we drew new eyes to this issue. And the whole point was to do something out of the box and get people paying, paying attention to this because it's a huge issue but no one knows about it. But what I do want to say from this one voyage, one image that I think sums this up. This was a rainbow runner they caught 500 miles off the coast of Oahu, cut open the stomach, and found 17 pieces of plastic in its stomach. Now this one they didn't eat, as hungry as they were, and the reason for that is what we know about the way plastic behaves in the marine environment. Plastic is both made with synthetic, synthetic additives, bisphenol A and phthalates and other endocrine disruptors. Plastic in the ocean will absorb chemicals, POPs we call them, PCBs, DDT, other chemicals. They don't mix with water, but they stick to plastic like a sponge. In fact, one single particle has been shown to have up to a million times higher concentration of these pollutants than the seawater around it. So now we know chemicals sticking to fish, fish eating, um, chemicals sticking to plastic, fish eating these plastic particles, what's getting into our bodies? Now, I was thinking about this also on a personal level. Um, today I turned 37, and when we finish all these adventures in plastic bottle boats, Eventually, we want to settle down and start our own family. So I'm wondering what's in my body. Just how synthetic am I? So we did a blood test. We took my blood, sent it to a lab up in DC, and here's what they found. Trace levels of PCBs, DDT, much higher levels of flame retardants, and trace levels of PFCs. Now we're talking parts per trillion. So we don't know yet what sort of impact this will have. We don't know where these chemicals came from. What we, what we do know is that the best place for me to do is to have a child. This was a study done called 10 Americans, and they looked at the blood of newborn babies, and they found upwards of 287 chemicals in the umbilical cord blood of these babies. So these are being passed on to the next generation. We really have to think about what is this toxic legacy that we're passing on. So this raises all kinds of questions. It's a brand new science. Another question that Marcus and I began wondering is, okay, we know there's plastic in the North Pacific gyre, but what's in the other oceans? So we cobbled together our wedding money and started our own 501c3 and decided to go to all five subtropical gyres where we think that plastic pollution is accumulating. We started off with our honeymoon voyage across the North Atlantic gyre from St. Thomas to Bermuda to the Azores. And here's what we found. The North Atlantic is also called the Sargasso Sea for this brown algae called Sargassum. And here is where we saw the closest thing to a garbage patch. Embedded in these mats of sargassum, bottle caps, and shotgun shells, and boots, and all kinds of, all kinds of plastic junk. Some of the things that we found floating around in these mats of sargassum, every single sample we collected had plastic. So we now we've seen another garbage patch in the Atlantic Ocean. We braved a hurricane, everyone was fine, a little seasickness. And here was our last trawl, which looked very much like we've, what we've seen in the North Pacific full of McTofid fish and this soup of plastic fragments. 
and here's where we landed, in the resource. <coughs> now these islands in these gyres are often like nets, like sieves for this plastic debris. So if we're gonna talk about cleaning up the gyres, this is the best place to start. We got home and we got an unexpected invitation to cross the Indian Ocean gyre on this boat. This is not our boat. This was one of the most amazing boats I've seen. It was kind of like a playground for people into this issue. We would climb up the mast, or the best place on the boat was up on the bow sphere, watching crash and dolphins go by. So we sailed from Perth, Australia, to Mauritius off the coast of Madagascar, and here's what we found. Another garbage patch in the Indian Ocean. Trawl number two, not much, just one piece, a bunch of uh, Portuguese man of war. But as we got closer to the center of the gyre, we saw what we've seen in these other oceans. A plastic soup from our refuse that starts on land. And some fun things too. A puffer fish and a fish that we still have not identified yet. So quickly to talk about solutions. Um, we now know that there's a problem out there. Can we clean it up? This is the top question that, that people ask. Isn't there an island of garbage floating out there? Can't we just go get it with nets? Well, this is more or less what it looks like. What, what that jar that, and that jar that came around the room, that represents roughly three football fields of areas condensed into one jar. So it's super, super spread out. Cleanup is really not an op option. Can we recycle our way out of this mess? Now, for fun, sometimes we like to go to landfills and recycling centers. Um, and we found in Los Angeles, in California, the landfills around our area, if you ask them what they do with all that plastic, with these plastic bottles that surround us and surround our cultures, they ship them all to China. And I would challenge you Middlebury students to find out what exactly happens to the stuff that we think that we recycle. I don't know what, hap what happens to it on the East Coast. On my coast, we ship it to China for another country to deal with. So we have to do better than that. Some things that we can do in our lifestyles right now is start thinking cradle to cradle instead of this cradle to grave mentality we've created. Instead of water bottles, some simple things that we can do is carry our own. Instead of plastic bags, we can carry our own. And we can start designing products that when we're through with them, become the raw material for a new product. We're gonna need to redesign the stuff that we use for disposables. Now there's no way to completely eliminate this disposable society that we've created. Nor is there any way to educate 6.5 billion people to recycle and not litter. There will always be loss. We need better designers and innovators to know that when this stuff gets lost at sea, it won't become bioactive. It won't attract chemicals and get into the food chain. And finally, we need better legislation to ban single-use disposables. It's happening around the world. China's banned plastic bags, and I could list the, the countries around the world. We've got to do better in this country and demand that our producers take responsibility for the long-term use of their products that they're profiting on. And finally, we need you all to get educated and to join this quest. <laughs> Thank you very much.